Okay, and here we are with Mr. Neil Milburn, one of the creators of this very unbelievable rockets from Amadillo. Okay. Hello, Mr. Neil. How are you? Doing good. Good afternoon. As, uh, as Manuel said, my name is Neil Milburn. I'm the Vice President of uh, Program Management at Armadillo Aerospace. And we've been, uh, we've been building and flying rockets now for uh, the better part of 12 years. Um, we actually have more rocket-powered flights than the rest of the, uh, uh, the industry here in the United States combined, with the exception probably of NASA. Uh, we have several hundred flights under our belt across a dozen different vehicles, all sorts of uh, propellants and uh, different flight combinations. Um, at the moment, we're working on the Stig family of vehicles, uh, which is a, a suborbital research vehicle, a reusable sounding rocket uh, that will take scientific payloads to suborbital space, greater than 100 kilometers, uh, for both NASA and for, uh, for, for commercial payloads as well. The next flight is going to be of uh, Stig B, the second in the, the series, and uh, it's scheduled to fly end of May, beginning of June, and we already have four payloads in, uh, in line for, uh, for that flight. It should go to about 100, uh, 120 kilometers uh, or thereabouts. It's a, uh, a precursor vehicle for the next generation of vehicle, which Madame has just taken a photograph of the, of the model. This is the, the Hyperion class uh, suborbital manned vehicle which we can use for not only scientific payloads but the capsule is about the same size as the, the Gemini vehicle so it's a two-man capsule to, uh, to take people to suborbital space on space tourism rides. Uh, the goal is to bring the cost of space travel down for the, uh, the general public. Uh, you should be able to take a ride to space on this uh, the same manner as, uh, as Al Shepard um, in the early flights of the, the Mercury program, uh, 200 kilometers for about 100,000 US dollars to begin with, and we're sure the price on that is going to come down as we find there's more competition in the marketplace. Uh, this vehicle should be flying within, uh, within a year or so, and we should be offering commercial flights to paying customers within, uh, within two to three years. Um, how can we help uh, help promote this program in uh, in Brazil? How can we help uh, help Manuel? Uh, in the short term, I think we're going to be one of the few companies that really can offer flights for scientific payloads now, as opposed to in uh, in one or two years' time. Uh, Stig is flying now. We've already had two flights of the Stig A, uh, and we could have flown her again much much sooner, but we decided to. Uh, go for a larger vehicle. Stig B is about 50 centimeters in diameter and about 10 meters tall. Uh, and so we'll take large scientific payloads as heavy as 50 kilograms up to, uh, to 100 kilometers. Uh, and on this next flight, we already have four payloads scheduled to fly on the next Stig B flight. Uh, and we hope to fly her once a month after that because it's not only a, a, a payload flight for uh, for commercial users and for NASA flight opportunities. It's also a test vehicle for the technologies that we need for the, uh, for the Hyperion vehicle. So we're flying the exact same engine on the Stig flights. We would have eight of them on the Hyperion vehicle. The recovery system that we use, in, which is a two-stage, would also fly on, on Hyperion. And the flight computer, uh, the flight computer that's, uh, that's on Stig, we would have two of them on here, one in the capsule and one in the, uh, the booster. The recovery system is in the top, a small balute that comes out at Apogee, uh, a supersonic balute that will bring it down tail first till we get to about 3,000, 4,000 meters above the ground level. Then a larger parachute comes out <clears throat> and that's actually going to glide it back towards the landing site. And then with just a few meters to go, we relight the engines to make her uh, make a land right back on the path that she, uh, she took off from. Uh, the capsule on this is about the same size as the Gemini capsule. So it's a, a two-man capsule, uh, about two and a half meters in, uh, in diameter and about three, three and a half meters tall. And this whole vehicle is, is again, about two and a half meters in diameter and about 10 meters tall overall. So it's a, it's a big unit. Uh, on the underside, you can see the, uh, the landing gear, uh, these four insulated pads, and there are eight engines on there. Um, 
eight engines because we're actually going to use these engines for, uh, for not only lifting the vehicle up, but for roll control. They're actually banked, uh, grouped into two banks of four, and we can lose any one of the engines during the boost phase and still be able to recover. If we lose an engine, we won't try and go to space, but what we'll be able to do is fly it to a sufficient altitude and burn off propellant so we can start to recover the vehicle with the parachutes in the same way we would with a nominal flight. If we have a major system malfunction, so the booster just quits working altogether, then what we do is we'd separate the capsule at this point and let the booster fall away to its, uh, its own doom, and then this capsule would recover. We would have uh, the, uh, the two-stage system to work with and an emergency chute, which would just be a huge, large canopy, which wouldn't necessarily bring it down to the landing point, but it would bring it down safely at some point on the, uh, on the spaceport. Lots of, uh, lots of large windows on there because this is definitely going to be a, uh, an experience that you won't want to forget. I've been waiting for, uh, for 50 years to, uh, to make, my, uh, make my first flight and become a, an astronaut. And uh, can't, wait to, uh, can't wait to get up there and win one of the test astronauts before we, uh, before we fly this vehicle to space for commercial passengers.